Good afternoon, it's two o'clock. Good afternoon, it's two o'clock. It's time to get back to it. Praise the Lord. If you are receiving from the Lord, don't feel like you need to get off the floor. Stay where you're at. It's okay. How many have been blessed by what you've received so far? Yeah. I know that I know that I've been blessed. Um, I love I love some of the perspective that William expanded on this morning on how how uh, the law is in place to show our need for grace. And um, it's a powerful, powerful time. Uh, I've really felt like there's been, and I think somebody said it to me a little bit ago, that they just feel like they're being washed in the word, which is a beautiful thing. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit today and um, kind of just call us into this place of surrender and preparation and um, I believe the Lord is, is bringing us to this place to where there is a, a need in our lives to put stakes in the ground. You know, sometimes if you don't put a stake in the ground that says, I'm not moving beyond this point, I'm not moving back from beyond this point, it's easy to, to forget and it's easy to be pushed to places you never intended to be. And so um, I kind of feel a little bit like a, today, like a mosquito in a nudist colony. Well, what that means is I know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm not quite sure where to begin. And so um, you know that there's a nudist colony in Fort Pierce, right? Sunny your palms. Yeah. When I was a teenager, I went there. My, my friend and I were driving down Highway 70, and he says, take your shirt off and roll the window down. And that was back in these days, you know? I said, what are you talking about? He says, just do it. You're not going to believe what's about to happen. And I thought to myself, I wish I'd never experienced this, because <laughs> this is not where the pretty people hang out. And, and so he drove us through there like we were a couple nudists, which was really weird because we were like 17, and there's no 17-year-old nudist at Sunnier Palms. Um, but anyways, that's kind of how I feel today. Like, uh, I know what I'm supposed to do, and I'm not quite sure where to begin. So, you know, um, we li we're living in an interesting time. Have you considered that? We're, we're living at an interesting time, and we're, we're living in this time in history where there are so many, so many lenses being put before us to shape our view of what's going on in the time. And uh, William said it last night. I've said it a thousand times as well. Um, you know, if you are obsessed with the news, they're putting a lens in front of your face. And that lens will shape the way that we see things in society. Just the very fact that you live in America is a lens that shapes the way that you view the world that we live in. And one of the most dangerous for me, and I don't mean dangerous in a good way, I mean dangerous in a bad way, one of the most dangerous perspectives as Christians is the American Christian perspective. Uh, the American Christian perspective is generally lazy, entitled, arrogant, and, and they think that they have a cornerstone on theological truth. But the reality is, is as a believer in Jesus, we're part of a family, a global family, and this global family has many times a better perspective of how the body of Christ is supposed to function than the American church does. 
um, there's this guy out of Ottawa, Canada named Al, um, Alan Caron, and he, he writes this book on apostolic centers, and it's so interesting because he's in French-speaking Canada, and he's talking, writing a book about how the church of Antioch is actually the model for how the church should function globally. It's the idea of receiving people, training people, sending people. And as he's talking about this, he's talking about the church of the, the apostolic model in, in the world today. And he says, what you see in true apostolic hubs and true apostolic um, ministries that are, that are truly filled with that purpose one of the common things is they worship more like Latin people than American or Canadian people. There's, there's, there's somebody said fiesta. Who said fiesta? All right. Well, there is, there is a party mentality because in the kingdom, it's very difficult for us to not be truly citizens of the kingdom of heaven and not be um, excited about what God is doing on the earth. To me, there's nothing more pitiful than a believer in Jesus that is miserable. You know, just, if you're going to be miserable, don't tell people you're a Christian. Wait until you get joy in your life, then tell them your story of how you were an unbelieving believer, and then when you began to believe, you got joy. Right? And... It's, for me, it's, it's this idea that we are at a time in human history like no other time. The world is smaller than it's ever been. Right now, anybody with internet access uh, can be watching what's going on in this room from anywhere in the room, anywhere in the world. It is a time for the gospel to be proclaimed in the most creative, expressive, far-reaching, and quite frankly, least expensive ways that the world has ever seen. Because if you have a phone and you have internet access, you have the ability to share the gospel globally at zero cost to you. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars to get on an airplane. Now, we're still called to do that. But if you think about it, the world has become so small. And, and what, what the enemy intends to use to destroy lives, because the reality is, as the world has gotten smaller through technology, and the world has gotten smaller through social media, and the world has gotten smaller through the internet, uh, the enemy uses those things to destroy lives, but the, but the blood of Jesus redeems things and actually puts us in a position to take back what the enemy has used and use it for God's glory. And so, I believe that we're at this time that's written about in First Chronicles chapter 12 about the sons of Issachar, it said that they are men who, under, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And I believe as the body of Christ, we're in this position where we need to begin to consider, are we people who have understanding to know what we should be doing as the church. Are you with me? Yep. This is, we're, at, we're at an interesting time in human history where we need to understand the, through the understanding of the Lord, and, and William said it last night, and I want to highlight this, that when we operate on the word of Christ, the written word, the the rhema word, the perceived word, when we operate on the word of Christ, we now know what to do. We now have understanding. See, you don't have to know what to do. All you have to do is understand to recognize the voice of God and do that. That's all you have to do. That's the only skill, which isn't really a skill, it's a surrender, that, you, that if you will position yourself, if we will position ourselves to hear the voice of God, and then simply do it. We will be like the sons of Issachar. 
We will know what's going on in our time. We will know what's going on in our age. And we will know how to function accordingly. See, the American church, the American church has this thing where we want, we want society to fit inside our old boxes. You know, you ever put your Christmas tree back in the box it came in? It works okay for a year. You might be able to make it work for two. But somewhere along the way, you have to break out the duct tape. This year in my house, we got a new Christmas tree because the tree we've had for the last 10 years was a point of contention because my wife did not like how it fit back in the box. And she thought it was going to be full of spiders as additional ornaments. And so instead of having a fight, we got a new tree. But I want to say this, that we have to stop expecting the generations that are being raised up today to fit in the box that even came before us. We have to stop expecting people that are raised in an internet age to function like they were raised in the newspaper age. Because when you're raised in the new newspaper age, you had time. Do you remember the days? Do you remember the days when you would get home at the end of the day and there'd be a little machine with a light flashing on it? You'd push the button and whoever was trying to get a hold of you had to trust that that machine was going to send them recording to you and you had to then make a decision whether or not you were going to respond to it. And you, as the person who left the message, fully understood that they may not get that message for days. And they may not get that message for days, and then they may not respond to you for days. And the only way to get you was to make sure that they called the phone at the appropriate time that you were at the other end of it. Think about this for a second. They could call your house and you not be there. And they had to do the same thing. But now we live in this world that is so fast that if you don't respond to a text message within minutes, people are offended. Don't text William because it takes him four days. And so these are the signs of the time. These are the signs of the time. And so there's this interesting thing in Matthew 11 where Jesus is talking and, and he's talking. And this is after, this is after uh, John the Baptist sends his guys to him and asks him some questions. Um, and then in verse 16, he says, But what shall I compare this generation it is like children sitting in the marketplace wait, calling on their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not answer. And we sang a dirge and you did not mur uh, mourn. So Jesus is, Jesus is saying, listen, we played a flute, a song of celebration, and you didn't dance. We played a funeral song and you didn't mourn. There's this idea that we have to become, a, we have to respond appropriate to what's going on in the spirit in the realm that we're living in. And so many times what's happening is we're not actually paying attention to what's going on in the spirit because we're not listening to the voice of God because we're not rooted in the word and every other voice is screaming at us. And because every other voice is screaming at us and our roots are not planted in the word, what happens is we don't even recognize the flute and the dirge. And it is our responsibility as believers in Jesus to be able to tune our ear to what the voice of God is saying and whether he's playing a flute or a dirge, it's up to us to then respond appropriately. About 20 years ago, 
Um, my spiritual father, his name is Mickey Evans. He was um, being honored for 50 years of being in the ordained ministry. And there were some crazy people at this service to honor him. Uh, a guy named Jack Murphy. You ever heard of Murph the Surf, the jewel thief? He was there. Uh, Frank Constantino, this little Italian Episcopal priest about this tall, short little fat guy, a former uh, mafia hitman, but now a bishop in the charismatic Episcopal church. Um, and then this guy named Bob Moody. Anybody here ever heard of Bob Moody? Yeah? All right. So Bob Moody was interesting because in the 70s, he was kind of a pioneer of a charismatic movement among Catholic nuns. And he gets up, and it was so interesting because this was in a Baptist church. This was in a Baptist church, and to watch the people's reaction um, was very fascinating because Bob Moody stands up and he says, 50 years ago, Brother Mickey, that's what everybody called him, he heard the music. And all these people are looking around, and they go, what music was he talking about? And, and then he takes his Bible and he holds it up in the air and he, sees, and he says, see, some people, they know the words of the song, but they never hear the music. And because they never hear the music, they don't know how to appropriately dance with the Lord. And so what we, what we have to understand is he was saying in his own ways the same things that Jesus was saying. He says, when, I played, when we played the flute, you didn't dance in celebration. When we played the dirge, you didn't mourn. It's because you don't understand what's going on because you're not appropriately connected to who God is because he's rebuking the Jewish people and he's, and he's saying to them, he's saying to them, you have no idea what's before you. And the reason I say that is because the next verse he says, for John came neither eating nor drinking and they said he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and he said, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. And so what we have to understand is Jesus is now saying, listen, you are not appropriately, you are not appropriately understanding the times that you live in, so therefore you're not going to respond appropriately moving forward. John did not eat or drink, so we said he had a demon. Well, John was preparing the way. Jesus didn't do any of those things because he didn't fast, or he did fast, but he didn't, he, he didn't, uh, he came eating, he came drinking, you know, he, he didn't function the way that the law said that he was supposed to function because it was man-made law, not God's law, and they didn't know how to deal with that. And so Jesus is saying, listen, you don't understand who I am because you didn't understand who came before me. If you understood who came before me, you would understand who I am. And the reason I'm right here doing these things in front of you, you don't have a grid to understand it because you don't know the flute or the dirge. And, and my concern, my concern is that as the church today, we are in a unique position because at no other time in history has the presence of God been more manifest on the globe because there is over 2 billion believers in Jesus, 2 billion anointlings walking the earth, carrying the presence of God. No other time in history do we have an opportunity to make the impact on the world than we do today. But are we listening? Are we listening? And it's so interesting because Jesus, when he says, you, you, you call me a glutton, you call me a drunkard, you call me a friend of tax collectors and sinner, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. When you dig into that, it's actually, some manuscripts, manuscripts will say wisdom is, wisdom is uh, justified by her children. And so I want to talk about this because as the body of Christ, it is time for us to stop thinking about the now and start thinking about generations. It is time for us to understand that it is, it is, we are positioned in a, in a time, if you're my age, 
27. Um, <laughs> see, you don't know the signs of the time. That's what I look like. When I, when, <laughs> when I look in the mirror, you know, every person has a mirror in their mind. That when you look and you have a mirror in your mind and when you imagine what you look like, you see yourself based on certain ideas of what you believe you look like. Some people see themselves skinnier than they are. Some people see themselves fatter than they are. Uh, some people see themselves less bald than they are. I have black hair. In the mirror of my mind, I have black hair. And so you can ask me right now. I know I have black hair. I realize it's relegated to one little strip right there. But that's it. You okay there, Clarice? Somebody need to cast a demon out of you? But here we are. Here we are. You know, what is, what is going on in the world that we live in? You know, quite frankly, I don't care. I don't care. Um, I do care, but I don't care enough to let what the world is doing to determine what I'm going to do. In fact, we're at this place. Just think about this for a second. Now, we're in Fort Pierce. What is the name, other alternative name for Fort Pierce? No, not the fort. Is it? No, 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 no. What's on all the, on all the Sunrise City? This is the Sunrise City. The fort. This is the Sunrise City. Don't you think that that's prophetic? Don't you think that that's prophetic, that, that there's this thing coming in this city and in this region? That in the tr and, and I think it's even more prophetic that this entire region is known as the Treasure Coast. Because the sun rises here, and the people here are the treasures of God. And don't you think it's interesting that yesterday all the eyes of the prophets of Baal were on Fort Pierce? Donald Trump was in Fort Pierce yesterday at a, at a court hearing. Don't you think it's interesting that the Lord has saw fit to have all the eyes of the world positioned in Fort Pierce? The Sunrise City. And I believe, I believe that if we consider what God is doing and we consider what God is doing in the earth and what he's doing in this region, that I believe that this city, this city that is oftentimes considered a lesser city than the, than the communities around it because it's a city that in some ways is depressed, it's poor, it has a lot of crime, it has all these things going on. What greater place for the light of Jesus to shine than a place like that? So what are we thinking we need to start thinking that the light is shining, rise and shine because his light has come. It is time for this region to rise because we are the sunrise city. All the eyes of the world are being placed in this area so that, so that the glory of God will be manifested that when revival takes place, when revival is becoming unleashed in this region, the eyes of the world will already be placed on it. This is not an accident. This is not an accident. And so here we are. What do we do about it? You know, it was, 
It was being discussed earlier. Jason talked about it. Will, uh, William talked about it last night. This idea of revival. You know that I think Jason was talking about 15 year, 15 year cycles of revival in Florida. You know, there's more than that. Florida, Florida is known as a, um, if you do a little revival history. There's there's um, a long history of revival, and actually from Jacksonville to Pensacola, it is actually known as the revival gate. Because there's places in North Florida, there's places in North Florida where there have been such movements of the power of God that entire uh, cities have been transformed in the way that you would hear about the Welsh revival. There's a place up in the, near the Panhandle called Crawfordville. And in the early 1900s to the time of around World War II in that area, it was mostly populated by black people. And when, they, and when the people of that community had a problem with one of the men in the community, they would take them out to this field and the presence of God would, and they would just leave them there. And the presence of God, this man's beating his wife and abusing his children, committing adultery. They wouldn't, they would take this man against his will, take him out to this field and drop him off and leave him there and the presence of God would fall on him and he would be completely transformed and go back into his community and live like a godly man. And this was transforming an entire community. And so I, I, I'm in this place in my life where I'm, I'm seeing where God is working and I'm waiting to see what's going to happen and the thing that he keeps telling me is revival is now. Why are we waiting on it? But you're looking at it like it's going to be a series of prolonged meetings like it was in Toronto, like it was in Brownsville, like it was in Lakeland. You know, and Jason mentioned it. We are friends with the pastor who, who hosted that Lakeland revival. We have things from them. All those flags on the back wall, for the most part, were a gift from them. All those worship flags were a gift from them. We have a lot of things from them that they've given us because the church doesn't exist anymore. But revival still is. This podium was part of it. And, and, but that's yesterday's manna. And we're in this place, listen to me, we're in this place where we have to understand that revival today looks different. Revival today does not, is not going to look, will this happen across the globe? Yes, it's going to happen across the globe, but it's going to change, and I believe it's going to change in this region. It's going to look different than prolonged meetings. Um, it's going to look like dining tables being extended. It's going to look like sons and daughters leaving their foster home and establishing their place in their father's home. See, Leif Hetland, Leif Hetland makes this statement that the greatest orphanage in America is the church. And I think he's a little bit wrong. I think he's a little, he's right, but he's wrong. I don't believe, let me talk about this region, the Treasure Coast. There's a lot of believers that treat the body of Christ like a foster home. They just, they'll stay in the home for a little while and they'll move to the next foster home. I don't like what's going on in this home. I'm going to move to that home. And you wonder why so many are immature. It's because if you never remove a plant from the pot, it never has a chance to grow roots. Last week during worship, I was sitting behind my keyboard and I had a vision of believers moving around the region in pot, as potted plants. And you know, you can, like an orange tree will grow in a pot and it will, and it will produce oranges, but they're going to be small. They're not going to have much juice and they're going to be good for nothing. In reality, all they do is get in the way. And so we have to begin to ask ourselves, are we going to remove ourselves from foster care and are we going to sit in the family of God? And the family of God is this thing that says it's not perfect. It's not perfect, but it's holy. How can it not be perfect 
and be holy at the same time is because it's God's system. And if we're going to truly see, listen to me, this is important. If we're going to truly see what we believe, revival coming into this region, it's not going to come because we have prolonged meetings, because all of the orphans that go from foster home to foster home to foster home, looking to be slain in the spirit, looking to giggle for an hour, looking to flail around like an idiot, they're going to come. Let them come. But it's not going to be sustainable because they're going to be looking for the next high. Like a crackhead. And the reality is is following Jesus and stewarding revival isn't moving from high to high. It's from moving glory to glory. And glory to glory is when an orphan realizes their family and they can sit at the table rather than serve the table. And I feel like the Lord has been saying over this issue, as we consider the signs of the time so that we know what to do in this moment, so that when we hear the flute, we know to dance. And when we hear the dirge, we know to mourn. I feel like the Lord is saying we are now, don't, that we are now in this place where it's time to prepare the nets. It's time to prepare the nets. I'm excited because the people in the room today are people who are with us and that say, I will prepare the nets with you. I'm not going to sit back, but I'm going to prepare them. We're going to prepare them by prayer. We're going to prepare them by focusing on what God is calling us into. We're going to prepare them by grounding ourselves in the word. We're going to prepare them by knowing who we are because when we're inundated with people who don't know who they are, we're the ones that have to bring the voice of truth into the lies that they've believed. Because it's coming. There's an entire generation of young people who are going to be mutilated sexually. And they're looking for answers. And who's going to be the ones that provide the answers? Not the ones that preach at them, but the ones who invite them to the table. There's an entire world. Listen, right now in the United States, there is a heightened, at more than any other time in history, there is a heightened a desire and awareness for spiritual things. Unfortunately, the spiritual things that there is a desire for are rooted in the demonic. So the body of Christ has to be preparing itself to minister deliverance to those who are broken. That's how we prepare the nets. But you say, but Pastor Lee, I'm scared of deliverance. It's probably because you need some. Is that like a lead fart? (laughs) Because those demons that are speaking to you back here, they're like, you don't want to be any part of that. You don't want to be any part of that. They might jump off of them and jump onto you. That ain't the way it works. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And when you become preparing your nets in order to be delivered so that you can be a deliverer. You get healed so that you can be a healer. And I believe that we're in this season. Listen to me. We're talking this weekend about becoming unleashed. Right now we need to become unleashed from the things that are keeping us in hiding. Rise and shine for his light has come. It's time. Am I the only one that feels this urgency in me that says it's time, it's time, it's time, it's time, it's time. It's time to start going into the marketplace and turning it to Christ. It's time to start going into professional places and turning it into Christ. It's time to go into the schools and turning them for Christ. Listen, listen, I was just talking to some people a moment ago about the school system and their kids being in school. Listen, don't back down. Don't back down. 
They cannot tell you to not proclaim the gospel of Jesus. They can't shut you down. They can't. And don't let them tell you they can. Because this is one of the things I know. Liars are going to lie. And so here we are. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Well, we're not going to back down. But here's the way Christians don't back down. We don't do like those fools did in 2020 and light our nation on fire. We don't do like Antifa and Black Lives Matter. We don't do that. We love so extravagantly that possibly to the end of ourself. We love so extravagantly that we lay our lives down for the sake of the gospel. And I know people that'll tell, that have said to me, uh, I'll go to jail for Jesus. I'm sorry, that's not true because most of them don't even go to church for Jesus. They don't even tithe for Jesus. They don't even love people for Jesus. They won't go to jail for Jesus. Are you crazy? They won't even drive 20 minutes to the church that God called them to because there's a boring one five minutes away. It's more convenient for Jesus. You know, I never understood that. I'm going to get on a soapbox for a minute. I'll drive two hours to go to a restaurant. That's about my limit. Two hours. I'll drive two hours to go to a restaurant that I want to go to. And I'll spend a lot of money if it's something on a special occasion that I want to do. You know, like when Brian takes all of us to the Brazilian steakhouse. It's public record now, buddy. It's on the internet, interweb. But people won't drive 30 minutes to go to church where they're encountering the glory of God and being positioned and, and equipped to change the world. I don't get it. I don't get it. And so here we are. Verse 20 says, oh, back to what I was going to say about the manuscripts talking about wisdom is justified by her deeds. And some manuscripts say children. This is a generational thing, folks. It's time for us to, as a, as a body of Christ, to make way for those who are in generation Z and other generations that are younger to begin to carry a mantle. It's, it's the older generation's responsibility to move out of the way. But not move out of the way, um, not move out of the way um, and say, have at it. Move out of the way in a way that says, I'm going to support you. I'm going to encourage you. Not jealous. See, I've seen way too many Way too many ministry leaders uh, hold on to a position like Saul held when he should have made way for David. And what happens is instead of Saul being David's mentor, he became his tormentor. It's time for, for ministry leaders and people to say, it is my responsibility to empower you to release your generation to make shifts in this world that reveal the glory of God so that the generation that follows you doesn't have to walk in the dysfunction that you're in. And then Jesus went on in verse 20, says, then he began to denounce the cities where most of his high mighty works had been done. 
because they did not repent. Now listen to this. These are the places where Jesus did amazing things in their midst, but they did not repent. Woe to you, Cherazine. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For mighty works were done in you, and you had... If, if the mighty works had been done in you, done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. They would have, they would have mourned. That's what he's saying. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than it will be for you. And for Capernaum, uh, and you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works that were done before, done before you been done in Sodom, it's, it would remain until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. So what is, what is the tension here? What is the tension? What is Jesus saying? Because we have to understand that tension is not a thing that merely gives a rebuke. Tension that Jesus is bringing here is not just something that's rebuking them for their lack of faith. It's a thing that is calling them into repentance. And what he's, what he's saying is this. If don't just take the mighty works that I do in your presence for granted, it's time to repent. It's time to change. It's time to release the glory. The mighty works that I did in you, I did them in you because I want you to do them everywhere else. And repentance is this beautiful gift that God gives us that we are now able to begin to think like he thinks. We are able to think the way that God thinks. When we, when we look to repentance, it's not this idea that we change what we do. It's not that we change necessarily uh, thought for thought. It's the idea that we change our thinking from our thinking to his thinking because we now have the empowerment of the mind of Christ and how can I think like I think if, his, if I'm yielded to his mind? And if I'm, yielded to his, if I'm not yielded to his mind, it's because I don't know what he's saying. The reason I don't know what he's saying is because I'm not paying attention to the signs of the time and I don't know what he's been saying for generations. You know, I've said this before, but I feel like I need to reiterate it. When Solomon was asked by God, what do you want? And he says, I want wisdom. That's what our Bibles say, right? That's not really what he was asking for. You know, one of the things I find that's interesting is, is sometimes we know what the Bible says, but we don't know what it means. Now, I'm not suggesting we read into it, but we find out what it actually means. We do the work, right? Because if, because if we actually required what the Bible says, all you ladies would have to be wearing doilies on your head right now. But that's not really what it meant. And so Solomon... Was he asking for wisdom in the way that we understand wisdom? No. Solomon was asking to be able to think and to process information the way that God thinks and process information. And it's what, what, Sol, what we have translated into wisdom was actually Solomon asking for God, from God prophetically for the mind of Christ. And so... Here we are. How are we, going to, how are we going to navigate the signs of the time? Here's how we do it. We get the mind of Christ. We root ourselves in his word. We root ourselves in hearing his spirit. Then we know what to do. So when the flute plays, we know to dance. And when the dirge plays, we know to mourn. We know what to do because we are like the sons of Issachar. We see what God is doing and we know how to adjust to it. We don't let the lens of the prophets of Baal. We don't let the lens of social media. We don't let the lens of political power. We don't let the lens of our financial systems determine what we're going to do, but yet we allow that the signs of the time are the lens that allows us to see through those things and what God is calling us to do in spite of what seems to be going on around us. Because we are in the sunrise city and the eyes of the world are upon us and it is time to rise and shine for the glory of God has come. 
And in this season, think about it for a second. Think about it for a second. In Isaiah, and I've, I've quoted it a couple times, but Isaiah 60, look at, what, look at what this is saying. I wasn't prepared to read it. It says, arise, shine, for the light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you in the sunrise city. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, a thick darkness over, over the people, but the Lord will arise upon you and the glory will be seen upon you and the nations shall come to see your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Who's been here the last couple days? The president of the United States, the last one. I'm not going to be prophetic in that and then in a year from now how to make some sort of apology video. You know what, though? In 2020, you know what I prophesied about the election? I prophesied that Donald Trump was going to win the election, but he wasn't going to be in the Oval Office. I don't know if we can verify that at this point, but I imagine at some point in, in the future, it will become a historical information that we'll look at. But you know, there's a part of me, this is just a little side note, there's a part of me that we're in the position that we're in as a nation that's glad about it. And you say, how could you be glad about it? Because inflation is putting people into poverty. There's people running across our border. There's murders happening in the streets. Um, but where's the church? Because there's a separation of wheat and chaff going on whenever there's pressure placed. Where's the church? Are we weak? Or are we strong? Are we kicking footballs across our stage on Super Bowl Sunday? And making our church services a mockery? Did you guys see that? That church in Cincinnati did that? They get 52, you get 52 Sundays a year if you're a Sunday morning church, you get 52 a year, and the fact that you would use it to play fun and games instead of proclaim the gospel is a tragedy. Because there are lost and broken people in this world, and, and Isaiah Sandoval said it uh, best. He says, what would your lost drug addict friend think if that was the first time they came to church with you and they're being a fool? That's not the Jesus that's going to set me free from the bondage I'm in. But I'm going to tell you something. I know that Jesus that will set you free. I know that Jesus that will shift the culture. I know the Jesus that will come in and things in our lives, things in our lives that we think are godly, he's going to flip them. Are you willing to be flipped? Are you willing to be challenged? Are you willing to be in a position to where the things that you've rested on as your truth begin to become upended because his truth is a superior truth? Because I believe we're in this season where the superior truth of Jesus is going to rise and the body of Christ is going to rise with it and we, just like he, will rise and shine for his light has come. But we have to plant ourselves. We have to plant ourselves. And this revival, listen to me, it's going to look different. This revival is going to look like family. I received a call, and it's going on all over the country, and it's going on all over the world. I received a call on Monday from somebody that says, listen, we're kingdom people. We're kingdom people, and I got your name from this other kingdom person that lives in New York. This, their life coach, actually, is a friend of mine, and she lives in New York City, and the person says, Jenny told me to call you. And she's, I said, okay, what's going on? And she says, we're kingdom people, and we feel like the Lord is wanting us to buy a small farm to create a place for kingdom families so that we have an extended table for those orphans who are looking for a home. 
And they weren't look, talking about orphan orphans. They were talking about believers who have been looking, who they, their perception of God, William said it the other night, as the Godfather or the taskmaster. Instead, people are genuinely looking for God, the Father, that will sit down with them and let them just put their head on his chest. You know, that's really what I think revival looks like is when there's, a, when there's a body of people who are so familiar with the presence of God because it's not something that they fear, it's something that they treasure. And when you're so familiar with the presence of God, what happens is you can sit in it and then you can take it with you and you're not afraid of the presence of those around you. Because what happens is we start to experience the presence of God, we then carry the presence of God. The, experiencing the presence of God is not about church service, it's really about a state of mind because his presence is always there. Uh, I like how William d delineated last night that, you know, this prayer, come Holy Spirit. How, why do we pray that? Because he's always there. It's because we're asking him to manifest. Right? And so now what we're saying is as we walk through life, we're saying, come Holy Spirit, manifest throughout my life, manifest throughout my presence, manifest throughout my operating of my day. And as you manifest, the glory of God is risen upon us and things are changed. We got to stop looking for the glory of God when we have church services and look for it in our every day. This is how revival happens. But we have to know the times. And I feel like we're in this place of tension. That there is a tension between the times. Because at no other time in human history, no other time in human history has the, has the church been as expansive and potentially able to expand throughout the globe through, the, through media and technology and, and the fact that roughly 20% of the world's population claims to be Christians. Unfortunately, as, as William said, they, they're, they've made him Savior but not Lord. What would happen if half of those who are operating just to keep out of hell would actually start to uh, operate in a way that they were robbing hell? What would happen? The world that we live in would begin to become transformed to the state that God intended in the Garden of Eden. Dominion would be restored. Dominion would take place. And what would happen is we would begin to see this world transformed and wisdom is justified by her children because our children will take the seeds that we planted in their lives and they will take it further, faster, and better than what we did. That's what revival looks like. We have to, we have to repent, begin to think the way that God thinks, begin to think the way that Jesus thinks, and we have to begin to understand that hell is not a place that, that we're escaping, but the reality is my perspective is hell is a place that we should be going and robbing it blind. We rob it by winning souls for Jesus. We rob it by healing the sick. We rob it by casting out demons. We rob it by destroying the works of Satan through the power and the name of Jesus. Not afraid, not afraid. This is what Jesus was talking about when he's at Caesarea Philippi and, his, and, he, and Peter says that the gates of hell shall not prevail. And, and, and I realize as, I, as I've thought about that verse for the last 20 years, I, I, I've had different thought processes on it. And one of the thought processes that I've had over the years is that, and it was wrong, this was a wrong thought process, this was 20 years ago, that the gates of hell were moving forward. Because in our mind, we think that the world is getting worse. Anybody think that the world is getting worse? I don't see how it's possible because poverty is an all-time low in the world. You know why it's at an all-time low? Is there a lot of poverty in the world? Yeah. But it's at an all-time low. And why do you think that is? It's because Christians across the globe are doing things to eradicate poverty. Look at the lifespan the average lifespan. It's in its 70s. 
back 500 years ago, it was in the 40s. Diseases are being eradicated. The world is a better place because Christians live in it. Is that not revival? So what's the sign for the time? Is it a time to dance? Because we are at such a great time in human history? I believe it is. It's a time to celebrate what God is doing. Or is it a time to mourn? I believe it is. I believe that the Lord is calling us into this place where we understand that his holiness is so holy. And that he's calling us into this place to where we surrender our will and we say, God, whatever you want to do in me, I make myself available. Not whatever you want to do through me, whatever you want to do in me. Not what you want me to go and do, which that's part of it. But what do you want to do in me? What do you want to refine in me? What do you want to change in me? What do you want to make that is not like you into like you? And I believe when we see that, what happens is we begin to become unleashed in the kingdom and the glory of God is manifested. Because when two billion Christians walk around who are saying, Lord, kill everything in me that's not of you and everything that is of you, help it grow. What's going to happen? Something's going to happen. And so here's what I want to do to end. If you'll stand up. Sorry about that. Close your eyes. And I want to ask you to just set your affection on the Lord. Set your affection upon the Lord. And if you're in this place and you say, Lord, I see you operating in the world. And I want to cooperate with you. Put your hands on your heart. You're putting your hands on your heart because it's a prophetic It's a prophetic act of saying, Lord Jesus, I want your mind and your ways to move from my head into my heart. I want to lay down the things that are not of you. I want you to come and reveal them. And I want to repent. I want my heart and my ways to reflect your glory. I want my heart and my life to be rooted in your words. I want my life and my heart to be rooted in your truth. I want my heart and my life to be the to have your truth as the lens of how I see what's going on around me rather than the world dictating my view I want you to dictate my perspective
Lord Jesus, I want to be the revival that changes my family. I want to take on the name revival. I am a revivalist who my family will be revived because I am in it. I am a revivalist that my workplace will be revived because I'm in it. I am a revivalist that my church will function in revival, not because of the praise team, not because of the pastor, but because I am in it. Because I see the signs of the time. I see where you have called me. I see where you have placed me. I see who you have placed me with. And because of that, I know what I must do. I must live revival. My life was designed to rob hell. Your life was designed to rob hell. Because the gates of hell shall not prevail. My perspective on the gates of hell today are like one of those PVC pipes at a gated community. Doesn't keep anything out. It's all for show. It's all for show. So in Jesus' name, I'm going to pray over you. In Jesus' name, I declare over these people that we are revival and we bring revival wherever we go. That we are people who see the signs of the time, that we know what's going on and we know how to function, that we, that we are listening to your voice. And when we hear what you're doing, when we hear the songs that you're playing, we know how to respond appropriately. We know how to respond appropriately. There's something in me right now that says that there are people in the room who, who want revival in their home, but because of unbelieving spouses, that they think that it's, that it's being blocked. And what I want to tell you is, is that if you continue to be a revivalist in your home, salvation will come. So as you're there with your eyes closed and you're just setting your affection on the Lord, I have a question and I just want you to keep your eyes closed. Not because I want you to be, not that, so that nobody sees you, it's because I want everybody to be focused on the, on the Lord. But is there anybody in the room as I've been praying, feeling this sense of like uneasiness in their gut rise up in them? If, if that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Like this, it's this uneasiness in your gut. Maybe it's just the ribs I had for lunch. So, in Jesus' name, I declare that this is a people of revival. That the, that the constraints of the world do not hold us. That we are not, that we are not um, tied to what the world says we can do, but we operate in a different kingdom and a different government, and the things of God's government are the things that determine our destiny. I release in this room uh, the gift of evangelism. Some Some of you are natural evangelists, but the Lord is going to turn you into supernatural evangelists. Lord, we bless your name and we thank you for your goodness and we thank you for how you've worked in us this last day and a half and we stand before you with expectation. Lord, I thank you, Father, for these young people in this room, Generation Z, Generation Alpha, 
in Jesus name. I declare over their lives that they will take the gospel to places that are deeper, darker, scarier, more unreached, and they will reveal your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That you have, that you have given this generation a degree of creativity that the generations before them have not had, that you have given them sight into things that the generations before them have not had, that you have given them a, a, a capacity for compassion and justice that the generations before the, them haven't had. I believe Generation Z is going, it operates in a, in a degree of justice, and because of that justice, that there will be a, there will be a rising up kingdom justice uh, pursuers that will go into the world and places where things are, are unjust, they will bring justice. And it's not the justice of the world, but it's the justice of the kingdom. So Lord, we bless your name and we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to take like a 15 minute break um, at 20 till uh, William is going to uh, share this afternoon. Um, and so if you need to use the restroom, stretch your legs, buy a book. Um, I believe there might even be in the lobby some, am I right about that? Nope, never mind. No cloud? Later. So later tonight, there's going to be some uh, cookies and lemonade for sale to help a couple young ladies go to uh, camp this summer. You want to make sure you drop a couple hundred over there. And um, that's some cookies. And, uh, but we'll see you in about 15 minutes.